quarantine or with someone working from home. So the decision to stay in-house kind of worked to our advantage when our, our business kind of quadrupled. But then we were forced to add some people and we were able to look internally to add people to our loan support area. And even we promoted somebody up through the consumer ranks to do some mortgage business. So that was a really big win for us when you think about some of the successes at Citizen State Bank. And I kind of want to pause there and maybe let Nicole talk about what we might have done on the deposit side. Because prior to Nicole coming here, we were a wonderful company that offered checking and savings account. But we didn't have really any kind of aggressive referral program in place to make sure our clients knew that we wanted to have more relationships with them. And there's an art to doing that, right? You can't just force your way on to asking somebody that only has a savings account why they should have a checking account with you. So we created a new paradigm and I'll let Nicole talk about that. Yeah, definitely. So like Tim said, it was a little easier on our loan side, right? We had sales goals. They understood what their sales goals were. They knew they had an activity waterfall like Tim talked about. But on our deposit side, this was a brand new initiative. So what we did is we set up a referral system, like Tim said, asking for the business, right? Finding opportunities for our bankers to ask for the business. It was an, a unique adventure for us. Um, we did it in, in very similar ways to how we approached our sales side. We talked about the why with our staff. We set up those clear metrics and expectations with our staff. And then the most important part, we followed up with them as they went on their path. We provided support, guidance, training, and through that, we started to see the traction. 2020 was our first year with it. 2021 brought it about again in a, a more enhanced format, but it was always through supporting our staff, talking to our staff, explaining the things to our staff that we really saw the success. Tim, other thoughts on what we did on the deposit well, side? It's really, as she had mentioned, it goes back to those activity paradigms that we asked the loan people to do. If we say to every loan officer, just make five phone calls every day. It's up to us as a leadership group to provide those leads. But if that each individual person makes five phone calls or makes five visits when you can, we will guarantee them success. And my job and any supervisor's job as a leader is to understand what are the things you're saying during those phone calls? What are the things you're saying during those personal visits? If you're providing those value attributes, people will want to listen to you right? They'll want to do business with you. I always tell the people that are making phone calls, don't worry about getting someone to say yes right away. Very rarely will ever somebody say yes when you're making that phone call. What you're doing when you're making a phone call is you're planting that seed, right? You call somebody up that uh, you know might have a car loan somebody else or someplace else or a mortgage loan someplace else, and you're telling them that we value them as a client, right? We want to make sure that they understand we're there when they need them. And if there's ever a need, please call us back. And the whole personality of that phone call is designed so that when that client has an opportunity, maybe to look for a new car or to shop for a new house, they remember the attitude and the effort that our staff took and they go, you know what? I wanna call Tim back because I like the way he talked to me. And if you think about anybody's business on this phone call, isn't it the success determined by the way you speak to people? Right? I think about what Alicia's doing at Knight Berry in the sales environment. I'd be more apt to do business with someone from Knight Berry that talked to me professionally, that took some interest in me, that maybe gave me some value propositions, and then maybe not sort of asked me for the business right away, but said to me, Tim, I'm here for you when that opportunity arises. I'm going to remember that name much more than if somebody came in with the club and said, we, you should be doing business with me, Tim, so let's change right away. No, not everybody as a, as a listener might take that approach. And I understand that. You as business owners or as leaders of your, your groups have to understand what's that value paradigm that you want to present to your staff. Because if you think about it, any of you that have employees, the employees are a reflection on you. And we teach that to our executive group so they understand that when our people are out in the communities, we want them representing our company, themselves, and the community with the highest level of professionalism, primarily so that when there is that need, they remember us. So it's really worked well on that deposit mm -hmm. side. The other thing we did is we took that same theory and we turned it internally to our employees. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when we were training our employees, we had a really neat experience with one of our leaders out at a branch. She called and asked for some training on how to do a call. 
walked her through, did some role plays, and then she did her calls and she had one that did not go well. So she called Tim up and she um, wanted to wanted to kind of debrief and talk through it. And so instead of being like, oh shoot, you missed an opportunity or you know that was really a snafu, Tim just kind of took the situation and said, what do you think? What could have you done? And really provide that wholesome coaching. So she felt supported. She knew that it was okay to make mistakes. And she knew that she could still pick up that phone and feel comfortable. That's really how we approach that internally with that same thought process. You know, Nicole mentioned that, that wonderful, scary, and kind of negative word mistake. And it would be really interesting to open it up to a free for all forum on anybody's attitude about when you or your staff or your company makes a mistake. Now I get it, there's varying degrees of mistakes that maybe cost a little money, a moderate amount of money or a lot of money. But mistakes to me are such valuable teaching and coaching environments. And I remember the very first mistake I made, I thought, well, that's it for me. My boss is gonna come over and I'll be, I'll be working someplace else here quickly. And he, we walked through the process of of me explaining to him, how did I come to the decision I came to? And he agreed, he agreed, and he agreed, and he said, Tim, there's where you made your mistake. So if you fix that part of your decision-making process, you'll be that much better off when that same opportunity comes by you again. And you know what he did to me next month? When the same opportunity for that agenda came up, he gave me the decision because he knew I wouldn't make the same mistake twice. And I'm hopeful that our staff feels that way. And it's never fun to call your boss and say, by the way, Tim, I just blew it, right? I understand that. And it's the culture we create so that people feel comfortable. They can tell you that they made a mistake that predicates whether people stay with you. And, and I get it. I don't want people making the same mistake twice. And you know, what's the old baseball adage, three strikes and you're out. But it's the culture you create that allows people to grow from those types of mistakes. And, I remember in, in the second job I ever had, somebody asked me, how did you become a vice president? I said, I made the most mistakes. And he said, well, how do I get to that point? Can you tell me how many more mistakes I need to make, Tim? And he missed the point is that if you make mistake, 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 don't make the same one because you need to learn from those mistakes. And the other kind of painful value proposition about a mistake is how do you feel when you make that, right? And I always coach people, remember how you felt. Right, because when you, you're going to get asked that same kind of question, you're going to be presented with that same decision again. And when you get to the point where it might be the tough point in the decision process, think back to how you felt. Do you want to be there again when you make that same decision? So we're so concerned and, and coaching on the value of allowing people to go through that process. People become much better decision makers if somebody along the way grabs a hold of them and helps them understand how to make decisions, whether it's you know, building a house and what the decisions you make to build it the right way, or if you're selling title policies or title insurance, or if you're sitting down with a rich person trying to understand how do I manage their portfolio. If you're open and honest, people value that and, and all of you understand that. So good stuff on the deposit side. As we talked about COVID hit, we rearranged our company, business took off and it was like, we exceeded our milestones beyond any of our wildest dreams. And uh, I know COVID had a major impact on many, many industries. Uh, some people took advantage of it. Some people were devastated by it. Uh, you know, I, as I talk to my colleagues in banking, it's kind of six of one, a half dozen of the other. And we're kind of the six of the ones that really took advantage of it, uh, primarily by keeping people here but taking advantage of the significant low rate market. As I'd mentioned, our, our mortgage business quadrupled. In 2019, we closed $40 million in total loans. That's all loans, mortgage, commercial, ag, and consumer. Last year, we closed 102 million. And the cool thing is you sit back and think about that, right? We went from 516 loans in 19 to over 1,000. That's 500 more people that we got to touch. 500 more individual opportunities for us as a group of deposit people, teller people, loan people to make a difference in somebody's life that might not necessarily have bumped into us before. And I wanna swing into something that we kind of developed a couple of years ago. 
Uh, I'm sure all of you have a wonderful paradigm and a method and a madness to how you'd want to treat customer service, right? Treat everybody like you would want to be treated is one that comes to mind. But we sat down and we wrote something. I don't know if you can share that. Uh, in the middle of 18, we wanted to be able to hold ourselves accountable to a customer service model. So we ask employees to do three things at every interaction, right? And the first one is, can you see that? We ask everybody to greet each customer, whether it's on the phone or in person as a guest in your home. What does that mean? When we're able to, you, when someone comes into your lobby, you, you ask them if they'd like something to drink, you might take their coat, you might take their hat, you might, if you're not the main point of contact, make sure they're comfortable, and you might run to where they're supposed to go to make sure that the client or the employee that's waiting for them is aware that the person is there. And you might then go back to that client and say, Mary, we'll, we'll be right out with you. She's just finishing with the client. But we asked our staff, think about when someone comes to your house, how do you treat them? Treat them the same way when they come into the bank. Same thing with over the telephone. My very first year in my very first bank, we had a lady that answered the phone and I just happened to be out at a branch that year. And whenever I called the main office, I knew she was smiling. I could just hear it in her voice. And it was so fun to call there because Kathy would always take your call with a wonderful attitude. She'd ask you how you were doing. And she was the representative, the first point of contact when somebody would call into our office. So when we wrote greet, meet, exceed, and win, I always think of Kathy about greet each customer as a guest in your home, no matter what business you're in. The second thing we ask our staff to do is meet the expectations of that client. They're calling you, they're stopping in for something, whether it's advice, whether it's a transaction, or whether it's a cup of water, or whether it's to use the restroom. I want our staff to meet the expectations to run the transaction correctly, to open the new account right, to ask the right questions so that that client feels valued, right, or to open that loan or make the right loan decision, right? One of the first things I learned about making a good loan is the loan has to be good for the customer and has to be good for the institution. My first lesson in lending was to be able to tell somebody, I'm sorry, you can't afford the Mercedes, you can afford the Chevy. And I was like, I was like scared to death to tell somebody that you can't afford the Mercedes. And when I got done, because I apologized and said, oh, I'm sorry, I can't meet what you wanted, but well, here's what I could do. And they looked at me and said, I kind of like that, Tim. So I got over the hurdle of being afraid of maybe not meeting somebody's expectations, but in the end I did, right? Because I did things correctly. The last piece of the puzzle before you get to the win, I'll explain the win here in a second, is how do you exceed your client's expectation, right? And we teach our employees, take a genuine interest in somebody, right? Whether you're on the phone or whether you're in person or whether you're meeting with somebody, take an interest in somebody. Right, you, you might recognize or acknowledge, hey, I, I saw your new car today, congratulations for you. Or, wow, you really have a very nice and neat office. Or thank you for calling in today, we're so glad you took time out to call us because we know you have so many options in the banking land, right? Think about the phone calls that you might make, whether it's to the cable company or the phone company. And if any of you work at the phone company or the cable company, I'll just apologize in advance or if you call for a hotel reservation or whatnot. And you might not necessarily feel welcomed when you're making that call, right? You might hear the sigh, ah, Tim's calling again. I just changed his selection last month and he's calling again. But I want our staff, and I would encourage any of you to take a genuine interest in anyone that wants to do business with you. Because if you greet each customer as a guest in your home, you run the transaction correctly and you're meeting the expectations of your client, and you take a genuine interest in them, you're gonna win more business. It's guaranteed. It might not be right then and there, as we said earlier, but I will guarantee you when that person is sitting down at the kitchen table having that discussion about to change something or to do something new, they will remember you because you took that approach. And that's kind of what happened towards the latter part of our year last year. Um, we're not a, a widely known mortgage facility in the Chippewa Valley. We're a small little bank. Uh, when we started the year, we had about 75 million in total real estate loans in our servicing portfolio. And by the end of the year, we had grown it to 100 million. And I didn't even realize it. So I went to one of our, you know, some of you know Carrie Bovey. We're so fortunate to have Carrie. I said, Carrie, what happened here? 
Tim, I don't know. I just kept getting all these referral calls because I treated people nice. They were referring me to their friends, their neighbors, their coworkers. Uh, so it's just like this thing that happened because we decided to treat people well. You know, and we're kind of like a dinosaur. We don't have a polished uh, LOS system. You know, we're doing everything by hand. We still do the rotary dial telephone. We're, we're spending some money next year to upgrade our phone system. But we just kind of took the approach that we're just going to treat people right. We're always going to greet them as a guest in our home. And we, if, if we do that, when they go to the bowling alleys or they go to McDonald's when you can, or they go to the restaurant or they go to the family reunion, and when their friends and relatives are complaining about where they're at, you want your person to say, go visit Carrie Bovey. And that kind of happened to us last year. We're so fortunate. But the other thing it did is it kind of changed our expectations. It kind of taught us what we're capable of. And as you as business leaders or as business owners, when you go through a situation that maybe we've been through, maybe you've been through, you kind of find a lot of, up, out about yourself. What are we really capable of? When we sat down in the early stages of 2020, if someone would have told me, Tim, you're gonna quadruple your mortgage business, I would have said we better add eight people. But we did it with three because we found out what our staff was capable about. And what I attribute that to is the care and concern that we as an executive group show to these people. Now, you have to know that we're a company that expects and demands performance. I like to tell people that we're not a rest home for people that don't wanna work hard, right? Because you, you can't have it both ways. And we asked for two things, and we asked our staff to do two things very, very well. They come to work with a great attitude and they wanna work really hard. If they do those two things, we can almost guarantee them success. If you don't have a great attitude and a great work ethic, you're kind of going to struggle here because you're not willing to give us the time. Why should we give you the time, right? I have no problem with someone that tells me, I don't know how to do anything. But if you have a great attitude, we have the resources here. And as many of you do too, because I know some of you on this call are really skilled at convincing your people how to do things and do them very well. To me, that's half the battle, no matter what business you're in. Performance management. We had very little of a, of a culture on performance management. And when Nicole came in, I asked her to use her background and her skill set and her, her education and her personality to, uh, to sort of plop that on top of our company. And it was an opportunity for me to step aside and watch what we're able to do. And, and if you wouldn't mind, just talk a little bit about that as we kind of come to the end here, Nicole. Yeah, most definitely. I'm going to share a slide here again that's going to show you how we approached performance management. So let me just pull my slide up here quick. All right, so like Tim said, performance management, all the things we were asking our team to do, the goals we had set, it all centered around how do we actually make it happen? And that's what our performance management system was for. Uh, we geared our system around a couple different areas. So we said, you know, we have what we consider proficiency, or you could call it daily duties, things that have to get done in our bank to just keep the base things running, to keep, you know, the lights on, the customers happy, right? The other thing we couldn't lose sight of are what are those goals? Because to achieve our big strategic goals, everyone downward from that had to have a goal that participated. And so we couldn't lose focus on how do we keep moving forward, even though we have to keep doing all those daily things. And that can be quite a balance, right? To have to consider all the things that have to get done on the to-do list and then work on initiatives that are going to change process, drive business, uh, really move the organization forward. Those were kind of our big focuses in performance management. To talk to our staff about those, we created a system called one-on-ones or one-on-one -on -one meetings. What a one-on-one -on -one meeting is, is it's the employee and the supervisor. They get together at a dedicated time outside of the teller line, outside of maybe the employee's office, right? In an area where they can truly sit down and have a conversation about what's happening. In that meeting, that's where they're talking about, how's your job going? How are your goals going? What support do you need? What training do you need? So the supervisor is using that meeting to learn about their employee and what their employee needs. The employee is using that meeting to request the things that they need to let their manager know where there's some struggles. And then out of that meeting comes the follow-up, the support, and the systems. We coupled the one-on-one -on -one meetings with a year-end review or our annual review. 
our annual review was really just a compilation of the one-on-ones they had had throughout the year. We like our employees and supervisors to meet at least monthly, but we have some who meet as frequently as weekly. Maybe if you're in the midst of a project or a heavy um, operation and a goal, you're gonna wanna meet a little frequent or more frequently. New employees, you're probably gonna wanna stay a little closer connected to. And then, you know, for example, Tim talked about Carrie, right? Seasoned, has her book of business, has her referrals calling. They meet monthly, right? It, it makes sense. They check in, Carrie's well on her way and, and they can go. So we coupled that annual review with those one-on-ones to really recap our whole year for our employees. In the annual review, we use this graph that you see or this image that you see up here. Those are what we call our company tenants. And our tenants are really the principles, or you could even say the values that we say our employees have to have these attributes to be successful in our bank's culture. And so we use these as a talking point. And so throughout the year, these come up, throughout duties, these come up. And then at the end of the year, we ask the employee to reflect back on these, and we ask the supervisor to reflect on them. What that did is it makes sure that our employees are aligned with where we're going. It helps us understand our employees and their needs. And then the final part of performance management, whether it's the end of a one-on-one -on -one or it's at the end of the annual review, we're always planning ahead. What's next? What are those commitments? What's gonna be worked on next? What's gonna happen in the following year? That's really how we approached performance management. The reason we looked at it that way is because otherwise, we wouldn't be having conversations. It might be three months, four months before we knew that someone was off track on a goal or needed help or needed training. So it just created that kind of cadence of consistency. The other thing that performance management really allowed us to do was assess our staff. And when we were able to assess our staff, uh, we were able to look at who we had and what talent we had within our organization. So Tim had talked about promoting from within. That is a thing that we have loved the, the wording and the verbiage of. And now we have a couple years where we've actually put it into action. And so what we did is we said, how do we grow our talent? One, because we have talented people here, they're producing and they've, they've earned the promotions. But the other piece, it's a challenging recruitment market and it's been for years. I'm sure everyone has a story about recruitment out there. So we said, we can't rely on being able to go out and find somebody. We have to grow that person internally. The trade-offs for an internal promotion program are, it's some initial time up front, right? You have to spend the time training the employee. You have to provide resources. You have to be willing to let them have those mistakes like we talked about and coach them through. But the payoff in the end is you have an engaged employee, you have an excited employee, and you also have a retained employee. So that was kind of how we approached performance management. It led us into this ability to have those internal promotions and all of that fed into how we reached our goals. Good stuff, thank you, Nicole. And as I'm listening to her talk, one of the, to me, she mentioned I met monthly with Carrie, uh, but that's kind of a fib. I don't think I met ever with Carrie. I kind of left her alone. And um, when you have, you know, that rock star employee, how do you let them know that they're still valued? I, so I, I, I managed to walk down the hall every now and then and poke my head in just so that she's aware, I'm still aware of her, how appreciative I am of what she's doing. She's kind of the foundation of our company, a local girl that's grown up in this area. You know, if, if we made a decision to have a face of the company, it might be Carrie Bovey. And, and uh, so I'm very, very fortunate and proud to have her with us. But I really like what Nicole said, and I'm hopeful that you as leaders are doing this too, that are you asking your teams, what do you wanna do when you grow up? What do you wanna be? What's your, what's your plan for your career? No matter what stage you're in, if you're asking your people, it forces them to think about what do they wanna do? Um, you have no idea what might be sitting inside of your company just waiting to be asked about what opportunities might be there. And uh, we're very fortunate that We've got our, our staff, our leadership group to buy into that because I get it. It takes time out of a leader's day to sit down once a month or once a week and sit down with your staff and go through that process of, of how are you doing? Are you, are you meeting your activity goals? Blah, blah, blah. And, but it's so important. And uh, we're fortunate that Nicole keeps us on track. You always need to have somebody at your company that is a wonderful 
uh, manager of the managers, and uh, she keeps me in place. When I'm making a left turn, she kind of brings me back. Um, how do we stay motivated? You know, that's part of what Christy mentioned to us. And, you know, it's, it, it's kind of an interesting question. And, and I stay motivated because I don't like procedures. I'm not very good at it. Uh, I'm not very good at um, filling out a loan app or crossing the T and dotting the I, but, but I know how to tell others how to do it. And what's motivating to me is to be visible and to reward and recognize the people that work with you. And uh, I remember one of my first mm, months here, I sent a congratulatory email to the company about thank you for all the efforts that you do here. And I kind of waited to get, you know, maybe 10 or 12 responses back and I got nothing. So I'm thinking, okay, are people reading the communication that leadership sends out? So uh, I went to Kelly and said, Kelly, no one's responding to me. What's going on? Well, we don't do that here, Tim. <laughs> okay. So that's going to be kind of difficult for a people person who doesn't, you know, maybe I needed a pat on the back because the email was good. Or someone could have said, Tim, what a piece of garbage email that was. Give me some advice. But So I learned a lesson with that. Here's what I started to do, and, and, and it's kind of fun. Shortly thereafter, I'd send an email. And at the very end, I'd say, if you read this far, send me an email back that you read this, right? Kind of force people, it would tell me if they read it. So the very first month, we got 61% of 44 employees got that far. And then it kind of went down, it went down, it went down, the excitement went away. And so I did another thing six months later. In the middle of my email, I said, if you got this far, tell me you got this far. And then at the end of it, I said, if you got this far, capitalize the, the response you just did. And I got 21% of the people to read all the way through my emails. And I'm sure all of you feel that we're emailed to death, right? We have meetings to death. Those of you that use Outlook, if, you know, my favorite line is my calendar's blue. There's no time to think. There's no time to be productive. And that's kind of a problem, particularly in our business right now, and, and maybe some of yours. And how do you manage that? And to me, it's about recognizing and rewarding staff for a job well done. I remember my very first mentor, when I, I brought that topic up, he said, no, that's expected of you. Why should I tell you you're doing a good job when you're just simply doing what I asked you? And I thought, wow, I'm going to remember that because I don't ever want people working for me to feel that way about me. So maybe sometimes I do too much or maybe sometimes I don't do enough. But if I ask people to do things that they never thought they could accomplish, why wouldn't I come back? And if maybe it's not just Tim, but it's maybe the president of the company walking down the hall and shaking somebody's hand and say, I noticed what you did. Thank you so much for taking the attitude and the effort to do that. You have no idea the loyalty that you might be building with your teams if you take that approach to grab a hold of your people and show them the care and concern that whatever they do means something. I've even thanked people for making a mistake because it changed the course of the way we made decisions at our company. A small mistake out in the field might radically impact the way we do things going forward. You can't let those kind of things go unnoticed. So striving and thriving in COVID-19, it's kind of an appropriate topic because whereas we thought, how in the heck are we ever gonna uh, you know, survive in this environment? We ended up thriving because we looked within, we maximized our people, um, we kept them safe, we showed them that they were the most important part in the equation, even above all the activities. We gave them a conduit with, with Nicole and with Angie on if you're concerned about stuff. We created zones so that if we were attacked by COVID that we didn't have three people in the same department in one room. That was a brilliant move. When I heard zoning, I had no idea what it meant. So I, all the credit on our COVID strategies go to Nicole. Uh, it's just some kind of fascinating things that went on. Um, but reward and recognize and, and, and encourage people to stay on task with their activities is really how we encourage ourselves here to stay motivated. How do you stay focused? To me, that's simple. It's knowing where you're at at all times. If you're in a, you know, in a, a business that expects performance, I would assume that you've got targets to hit. And the assumption is that you know where you're at, right? And if you're off target, what do I need to do internally to get back on? Or if I'm over target, what do I need to do to make sure that I'm keeping up with my pace 
or if I'm over target, what lessons have I learned that made me successful that I can bring to the rest of the company? I, I worry that sometimes our staff feels like they're so isolated in their own little loan closing office or their deposit booth or their teller booth. What I want them to do is share their experiences, their excitement with the rest of the company, because it does two things. Somebody else might learn something from what Mary Sue says, and then Mary Sue is gonna feel so delighted and empowered because somebody recognized what Mary Sue did. You build such a loyalty concept to your company if you reach out your hand and you thank somebody, you tell somebody a great job, or you use the knowledge that they have, right? My favorite thing to do is to interview college kids. Because I asked them, tell me what you've just spent $84,000 learning that I can use in my business to change the way we do things, right? And it's so fun to have that conversation. And they come up with all these bright-eyed and bushy uh, ideas, which they should. They spend a lot of money to, to pay for these wonderful ideas. And invariably, there are wonderful things that change the way we think about things here at Citizens and the way we do things. Because someone tells me, Tim, you're a dinosaur. You got to get more current. And it's so valuable to stay focused on letting your people contribute to your business, right? And if you're, if you're not careful, two months after that new college kid comes to your uh, organization, they may come to you and say, my gosh, Tim, I've learned more in two months than I did in four years. That's kind of the gratifying thing because it's a, it's a, you know, it's a give and take. I want people to feel empowered. I want people to feel valued. Because when the recruiter calls, I want them to think, do I really want to leave this? But the other side of that, and I'll leave you with this, is that we want a company that's full of recruitable employees. Think about that. We want a company that's full of recruitable employees because they're doing the things we want. They're creating value. And if somebody really wants to move on, I'll shake their hand and say, remember me when it might be difficult or maybe not what you expected. That's all we can expect from that professional relationship that you establish with all of your employees. I'm out of breath. Uh, if there's anything that we can answer or whatnot, I can't believe it's six minutes to one. That went by really fast. I'm hopeful that we didn't bore you to death. If there's some questions out there, Christy, maybe I'll just kind of shut up here now and, and open the floor. Does anybody have questions for Tim or Nicole? I have kind of a testimonial. This is only like the third or fourth conversation maybe I've had with Tim, but I find myself just sitting kind of starry eyed because it's so, it's good to listen and you really, really care about your business and that's, it's empowering. So very great, very great advice that you had and I'm glad I Thank attended. You. Thank you. We, we have a lot yeah. of fun. Tim, I, I have people, to, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I tell people if you're not having fun coming to work, why are you coming to work? Come in and let's talk about it, right? You give me two things, I'll provide an environment for you where you get to enjoy it, you get to thrive, you get to succeed, and you get to have a career. That's the kind of legacy we want to leave here at our company. And I have to tell you, I have a quote that's hanging on my bulletin board next to me, and it says, stay close to people who feel like sunshine. And I got to tell you, on this cold, icky day, you have just spread so much positivity and I don't know how everybody else feels it's listening, but it's one of those things that makes you just appreciate little things um, so much more. And you know, the teacher in me knows how that encouragement impacts people. Um, and so it was just very, very empowering and uh, I really enjoyed listening. Well, thank you. And uh, as a side note, my degree is in music education, so I was a music teacher. And as a side note, I graduated from Kadat. Oh, <laughs> we should talk after the meeting. Sorry, it's Christina. Fancy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful little community full of people mm -hmm. that, oh my goodness, I, a whole new world opened up for me when I came to Kadat. I am, I am so glad that somebody sent me to Kadat to learn about people. It's a, it's a great community. So if we don't have any questions, I just want to thank Tim and Nicole so much for your presentation today. Just again, super, super empowering. Um, also thank our sponsor, um, Charter Bank. And then on a side note, our next um, series in Thriving and Surviving will be on Thursday, February 25th. Um, and it is a making, I'm going to uh, make your marketing meaningful. And it's going to be um, Christina 
uh, is going to be presenting on that. So if you're interested, um, uh, the link is on our events page um, and also on our Facebook. So again, thank you so much, Nicole and Tim, and thank you all for taking the time out to participate today. Thank you for the invitation. Of thank course. You. Thanks, thank you, everybody. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. It was great. Awesome job, Tim and Nicole. Really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christy. Thank you for having us. It oh, seems, yes. It was, a lot it, was, of fun. it was very yeah. empowering. So thank I had you. no idea. There's a little chat box over on the right. I'm <laughs> trying to read these things. And, and I can tell you, after participating in so many Zoom meetings, it was fun for me to watch the chat as you were talking. Yeah. Um, so again, yeah, you, you clearly have a uh, given a lot of people some food for thought today. Well, thank you. You know, as a someone that's given done this a few times, you always wonder how it's being received or recepted and are you bombing or are you boring people to death? And because I've kind of been talking about this same kind of people thing for many, many years. And I often wonder, is the message old? Is it outdated? And, you know, and, and maybe by coming to Kadat, I have a whole new audience to listen to 35 years worth of stories. So no, but it, it's it's very interesting to me, too, just because I, again, I go back to my background in education, and I am so focused on that relationships, and for me, COVID yeah. is hard, and the fact that I can't go out, like, I'm a yeah. membership person that wants to talk to people, <laughs> uh, put me in an event, put me in a room where I can it, be around <laughs> people, um, sure. and so, it you know, developing those relationships and connections and making that what you're, what's driving you at work is huge. Well, thank you so much for thinking of us. And yes, I can't remember the kid's name that came and sat in the same room. And and I wasn't really keen on when I left the meeting, but I thought, okay, if, if there's an opportunity to get asked to speak, what a you know, to talk about the company, to talk about some of the things. And if I guess I was always taught, if you're presenting and one person gets something out of it, Tim, that's one person that wouldn't have learned anything if you wouldn't have done it. So. Thank you so much for of for course. Us. Of course. Yeah. Have a great rest of your afternoon. You too. Thank you, Chris. Bye. Bye.